Welcome to our sixth webinar, Ottomans and their others, uses of soft power. As always, my gratitude goes to Ipek Cem Taha, the director of the Columbia Center in Istanbul, Merve Tezcanlı Ispahani, academic programs co coordinator, Sedan Gürlek and Eylem Taşdemir, program officers, and James Leitner, whose generous sponsorship is much appreciated. I thank our participants, Muhammed Satmalı, Nazlı Songülen, and Doa Öztürk for their well-researched and thought-provoking papers, and for enduring our iron preparation process in good humor. I would like to say a second thank you to Merve as she graciously accepted to take on the additional role of the discussant. As the title of the webinar indicates, the overarching theme of today's papers is the multiple uses of soft power over the others in the Ottoman Empire. Soft power is a concept borrowed from political science and we will talk about it later in our program. The length of the time bracket covered today from the 1720s to 1915 enables us to catch a good glimpse of the shifting soft power policies as well as their flexibility. Who are the others? Muhammad's are Safavids and Afghans at the edges of the empire. Nazlis are Ejnebis, foreigners on the Bosphorus, and Doas are upper class Egyptians in Istanbul and in Cairo. Muhammad reveals witty political maneuvers favoring Shiites over Sunnis to secure safer borders for the early modern Ottoman Empire. Nazli focuses on land acquisition and control over new settlements, addressing issues related to the growth of Istanbul along the Bosphorus shores during the late 18th century. Doa's paper evaluates the philanthropic activities of wealthy Egyptians and casts light on their situational and ideological rationale in the early 20th century. Following the template for all my webinar introductions, let me say a few words about the sources tapped by our emerging scholars. Vashvakan mm -hmm. Shivi and Suleimaniye Library continue to be the indispensable archives. Today, we add to our list early 20th century Egyptian press. That list is getting longer and longer. I will now introduce our speakers and our discussant. Mohammed Sachmali is a PhD candidate in history at the University of California in Davis. He will defend his thesis titled Early Modern Ottoman Universal Caliphate and Sunni Shiite Political Relations in the First Half of the 18th Century in the Coming Months. Muhammad graduated from Boazici University with a double major in sociology and political science and international relations. He holds an MA in political science and international relations from the same university. Between 2010 and 2014, he worked as a personal assistant for the late Sheriff Mardin in his book project on the Enlightenment era. Nazlı Songülen studied urban planning at Middle East Technical University and specialized in urban design. She then shifted her studies to history and recently completed her doctoral dissertation in the History of Civilization Department of the European University Institute in Florence. Her thesis titled Distant Land of Byzantine Holy Golden Cross in Early Modern Ottoman Istanbul, from the Istavros Vak village and royal gardens to the Beylai Bey neighborhood on the shores of the Bosporus, investigates the transformation of the Istavros Beylai Bey waterfront in early mo modern Ottoman Istanbul. 
She focuses on the changing land distribution policies and endowment practices on royal gardens. Nazla's research interests include urban and spatial history, politics of urban space, and the Ottoman Vakuf system. Doa Öztürk received his PhD from the Ohio State University's Department of History in August 2020. His dissertation, Remembering Egypt's Ottoman Past, Ottoman Consciousness in Egypt, 1841-1914, analyzes the prevalence of Ottoman consciousness in Egypt at a time when Egypt was gaining more political and economic autonomy from the Ottoman Empire, and when a more distinct sense of Egyptian national identity was developing. Currently, he is working on an article on Kadriye Hussein, a largely forgotten female intellectual and a member of the Egyptian ruling family who played an active role in the wider Ottoman cultural world and Egypt in the early 20th century. Our discussion, Merve Isfahani, is Academic Programs Coordinator at Columbia Global Centers in Istanbul. Merve received her doctoral degree from Columbia University Department of History. Her dissertation, Building Sovereignty in the Late Ottoman World, Imperial Subjects, Consular Networks, and Documentation of Individual Identities, examines the formation of Ottoman sovereignty in the 19th and early 20th centuries at the disciplinary intersection of international law and history. Breaking away from a strictly territorial understanding of sovereignty as a fixed legal construct, the dissertation explores shifting definitions of sovereignty within and across the boundaries of the Ottoman Empire, as well as its semi-autonomous provinces. Merve holds Master of Arts and Bachelor of Art degrees from Boadici University. Now the word is Mohammed. The Sunni Caliph defends the Shiite Shah. The Ottoman Universal Caliphate in the Persian turmoil of the 1720s. On October 8, 1722, the Safavid Empire collapsed after a long life of more than 220 years. In the next 25 years, Iran was ruled by Sunni regimes almost incessantly. According to assumptions on confessional rivalry, the establishment of Sunnism in Iran should have created a Pax Sunnica in a broader Eurasian region. However, seemingly paradoxically, the opposite occurred and the period witnessed major military confrontations. The Ottomans were actively involved in these wars and they supported Shiite Safavid princes against Sunni powers in all these struggles. Why did the port decide to side with the Shiite Safavids against, against Sunni Afghans during that period? This paper seeks an answer to this question by focusing on the political and military developments in the 1720s. I argue that the Ottoman political claim for the universal Sunni Caliphate, which secured Ottoman dynasties' legitimacy in their vast domains, paradoxically led them to adopt anti-Sunni policies in Persia. Furthermore, my study also challenges the scholarship on the Ottoman Caliphate that generally assumes that the sultans used their title of caliph in a political sense only in the 16th and 19th centuries. In this paper, I will first discuss how the Ottoman sultans' claim of universal caliphate functioned in the early modern era. Then, I am going to examine Ottoman support to the Safavids against the Afghans in the 1720s. This 16th century witnessed the expansion of Ottoman borders at a rapid pace. However, the port started to leave the expansionist policies in favor of a more settled policy in the second half of the century. The main reason of the shift 
was the port's gradual recognition of its physical limits with the available technologies of war and governance at the time. As a result, the port focused on reinforcing Ottoman sovereignty in a vast geography from the Western Mediterranean to the Iranian borders and from Crimea to Yemen. This reinforcement required the creation of a legitimizing discourse that would have constituted Ottoman soft power. The claim of the universal caliphate of the Ottoman sultans had occupied a central place in the exertion of the soft power. In the 16th century, the Ottoman claim to universal caliphate had coupled with policies at a global scale as well. In the 17th and 18th centuries, when the Ottoman Caliphate continued to retain its global character in theory, it worked regionally in practice. Critically, it was this global symbolic significance that made it work regionally. The global claim enabled the sultans to protect their dynastic sovereignty and Ottoman domains by delegitimizing opposing Sunni rulers. The port declared these rulers within and beyond the Ottoman realms as rebels, as rebels to the universal caliph. Ottoman scholarly elite of the 16th century quickly incorporated this new position into the official discourse. In his Ahlaka Alai, written in 1564, Kanalazade Ali, a high-ranking Ottoman jurist and Kadasker of Anatolia, characterized the Ottoman realm as the virtuous city, Al Medina Al Fadullah as opposed to the Aran city, Medine i Dalle. Then he divided the Aran city into two as infidel Aran, Dalli Kafire, and heretic Aran, Dalli Gayri Kafire. The examples he gave, he gave for the infidel Aran city were the Europeans and the Russians. The example for the latter was the Safavids who deviated from the straight path and became corrupt, Mezahi Bifasideh. With regard to the ruler of the virtuous city, Kanalazade asserts that, I quote, know that the administrator of the virtuous city is the righteous Imam, Imam Haq, and the absolute Caliph, Halifi Mutlak, and his governance is Imamate and Caliphate, and its purpose is to perfect people's souls and provide means of happiness, end of quote. Kanalazade's depiction provided Ottoman Sultan's authority with the utmost discursive protection. It isolated vast Ottoman territories and its perfectly legitimate ruler from other Sunni competitors with insurmountable religio-political and environmental walls. According to his formulation, Ottoman well-protected domains, Emaliki Mahruse, were encircled by Christians in the West and in the North and by heretics in the East. Even though he does not mention, in addition to religio-political walls, the Saharan Desert in Africa and the Indian Ocean bordered the southern parts of Ottoman territories geographically. In this sense, Ottoman domains resembled ancient Egypt, which was well protected against enemies through its isolation by geographical barriers of sea and deserts. I argue that this isolation, in turn, provided Ottoman rule with ultimate monopoly within, this, within that vast geography in the early modern era. The replacement of Shiite Safavids by the Sunni Afghans in Iran in 1722 signified the rupture of that geographical isolation, thus a challenge to the monopoly of the Ottoman dynasty. The crown prince Tahmasp fled from the siege and declared himself Shah of Persia in November 1722. A fierce struggle started between Mir Mahmud, the leader of the Afghans, and Prince Tahmasp. The port got into official communication soon with both of the competitors. While the Safavid prince asked for immediate help from the Ottomans and even offered certain lands to the port, Mahmud claimed equal status with the Ottoman sultan, let alone cede territories. Mahmud employed a heavily Sunni Islamic discourse in narrating the reasons of his war against the Safavids. The Afghan leader claimed to have waged war on the Safavids only to eliminate the Persian heresy and to suppress Sunnism. This was exactly what the port had feared most. A big consultative assembly meeting was held to discuss the letters of Mahmud and Tahmas on July 7, 1723. The Grand Vizier Damat Ibrahim Pasha pointed the Afghans as the primary challenge to the port rather than Tahmas. He purported that if Mahmud reached the current Ottoman-Iranian borders, 
and became the new neighbor, he could attract Ottoman subjects to his site. He said that the tribes inhabiting the mountains between Ottoman Empire and Persia, referring to mostly the Kurdish lords and their local forces, could leave Ottoman suzerainty and accept Mahmud as the suzerain. In this case, the Grand Vizier added, the increased power would render Mahmud a very dangerous neighbor and rival of the Ottoman Empire. He argued that only by building a solid and insurmountable levy between Mahmud and Ottoman domains could the port feel secure from the Afghan threat. He clarified that the levy was the lower lands in western Persia across the mountains marking the current Ottoman-Iranian border. In that meeting, Sheikh Yusam Yenishehil Abdullah Efendi proposed his legal solution to the problem of the Afghan alternative as well. He stated that once the Ottomans conquered the targeted Persian provinces, the port would ask Mahmud to recognize the supremacy of the Ottoman Sultan. He alleged that all Muslim rulers should have submitted to the authority of the Ottoman Sultan since he was the Caliph of Prophet Muhammad and also the ruler of Mecca and Medina. Abdullah Efendi concluded that in case Mahmud refused, then the Sultan was perfectly justified to overcome the Afghans through a war. Three weeks later, Russo Ottoman negotiations to partition Iran had started. The ensuing partition treaty of June 1724 determined the territorial shares of both imperial powers in Persia. The fifth article of, of the treaty declared that the Russians and the Ottomans agreed to support Tahmasp against Mahmud for the Persian throne. However, the following years, year witnessed Afghan victory over Tahmasp and a change in Russian policy towards a more passive stance in Iran. Unlike the Russians, the Ottomans captured the targeted provinces successfully as of the end of 1725. Changes in balances of power prepared the ground for the confrontation between the Afghans and the Ottomans. Ashraf, who replaced Mahmud, sent a letter to Ahmed III and claimed that he was also a caliph in Iran, enjoying equal political status with the Ottoman Sultan. He also demanded from the port to give all the conquered provinces in Persia back to the Afghans. A letter bearing the signatures of 19 Afghan ulama justified a chef's claims in legal terms. Upon this challenge, the port deployed its plan decided on July 7, 7 1723. Sheikh Hulistam declared Ashraf as a rebel in a fatwa that was signed astonishingly by 160 top-ranking scholar bureaucrats in Constantinople. The fatwa underlined in clearest terms that the Ottoman Sultan was the great caliph and it was unlawful to have two imams caliph at the same time. Ashraf did not accept the Ottoman fatwa, thus war between two Sunni powers became a matter of time, which occurred in November 1726 and ended with Afghan victory. I argued that the port's goal in this war was to replace Ashraf with Tahmas. After losing the war against the Afghans in 1725, Tahmas sent a letter to the port asking help at all costs. He asked for a three-year truce and Ottoman help to enthrone him in Persia. In return, he promised to recognize all Ottoman land acquis acquisitions in Iran. The port sent a certain Mustafa Efendi, who worked in finance bureaucracy to, to Tabriz to conclude a peace treaty with Tahmas delegate. Mustafa Efendi's job was a relatively easy one, concluding a treaty on the same conditions that Tahmas offered. Curiously, there seemed to be no historical source indicating whether the negotiations succeeded or whether they actually took place. Also, no work in modern scholarship digs out the aftermath of this critical historical moment. During my archival research, I found strong evidence about the conclusion of the treaty. Tahmas and his, his chief commander, Tahmas Kulihan, later Nadir Shah, sent letters to the port in the summer of 1728. Tahmas gave a good account of events starting from the fall of Isfahan from his perspective. Regarding the events of 1726, he wrote that he heard of the appointment of commanders in chief by the port to march on the Afghans and that he himself was ordered by the Ottoman Sultan to sit on the Persian throne. Nadir also wrote that upon getting these glad tidings, 
Tahmas prostrated himself in gratefulness to God. To conclude, a Sunni power in Iran created a major legitimacy crisis for the Sultan, whose political claim for the caliphate could be challenged by virtue of the new neighbors' shared religious identity. Against them, the port supported the Safavids, who posed a wall at the border protecting the Sultan's legitimacy. Ironically, what made the Sunni Shiite neighborhood more, more peaceful than the potential neighborhood of two Sunni powers was the clarity of the division itself. The ineligibility of the heretic Safavids for the caliphate in the eyes of the majority of Ottoman Muslims rendered the Shiite Safavids a safer neighbor for the Ottomans than any Sunni ruler. In return, the Ottoman sultans protected the Shiite Safavids to secure their coveted title of great caliph against Sunni contenders. Thank you for your listening. And now I pass it to Nazla. I start my presentation by sharing the screen. Yes, today I'm going to present you a part from my dissertation, The Land Policies in the 1780s, the formation of the Beylar Bey neighborhood in Ottoman Istanbul. Over the course of the 18th century, Ottoman Istanbul began to expand towards the Bosphorus. After the 1760s, the nuclei of some new neighborhoods emerged on the Asian shores of the Strait. However, this was not a spontaneous process, but realized through the initiatives taken by the sultans who commissioned new mosque complexes and socioeconomic facilities via their sultanic endowments, waqf, for developing new neighborhoods. The use of waqfs to generate new settlements in Istanbul had been a customary practice since the Ottoman conquest of the city in 1453. However, the sultans ordered the new mosques, this time on some royal gardens, Hadaiki Hassa, titled as Haslands, reserved for the recreation of the Ottoman dynasty and the high ranking member of the ruling elite. Then the sultans redistributed the remaining lands to the new residents of the emerging neighborhoods. In my dissertation, I address this process about which the relevant scholarship has remained silent. I argue that the formation of these neighborhoods was driven by the changing land distribution policies on royal gardens endowment practices and land holding dynamics among different actors with competing interests in each locality, as we shall briefly see in this paper. The formation of the nucleus of a new neighborhood on the royal gardens of Istaros and Beylerbeye, located between Çengelköy and Kuzguncuk, was among the examples. Here, when we focus the area, you can see that on the north, there's Beylar Bey Garden, and on the south, there's the Star Wars Royal Garden. And in 1777, Abdülhamid I ordered the construction of the Hamide Evvel Mosque in the midst of the Star Wars Beylar Bey shores. Before and after its construction, the Sultan's Hamidiye Bakf undertook a series of land transactions, after which residential units gradually begin to appear on the shoreline. The archival document that I will examine today amplifies the complicated process of land accusation in the Istaros Beylar Bey neighborhood and introduces us the actors involved in it. Thereby, it draws a nuanced view of the intricate dynamics behind the transformation of the Bosphorus shoreline during the period in question. The document that I have examined dates to the 23rd of October, 1786. Nevertheless, I should emphasize that this is not an official document. It resembles a draft of a letter and has no signature on it. Neither its content clarifies the author. However, in the catalog of the Ottoman archives, he was identified as a certain Musa A. His letter informs us about how this person first possessed a piece of land on the Istaros Beylar Bey shore and later transferred the possession rights of his estate to the Sultan without receiving any payments. The letter begins by declaring the location of his estate, which was a vineyard near the waterfront palace in the Istaros Royal Garden. Musa A, whose honorific title A implies that he could be a court functionary, a civilian or military officer, asserted that the Sultan had sent him an order two days ago, requesting the title Senate of this vineyard. He continued with the story of how he had come to possess the land. When a certain Efendi passed away, 
the land had been transferred to another A but had not been occupied. The letter does not clarify the identity of these two figures, um, nor when the transaction had happened. The treasurer of that time, Adam Efendi, a member of the men of Pan, Kalemie, was concerned that this property, located so close to the Istarvos waterfront palace, could end up in the hands of an Ejnebi, a foreigner. Upon Adam Efendi's insistence, Musa A had been forced to buy the land. Soon afterwards, he had also purchased a vineyard and arable field nearby from a non Muslim Zimmi. In his letter, Musa A claimed that he kept these lands in his possession in case they would be needed by the Sultan or a high ranking member of the ruling elite, or with his own words, Kurenai Sultanat Seniyeden bir zata luzumu olur garazila. Musa A continued his letter with a comment by a certain Abdul Haq Molla Efendi. Although there is no information in the letter about him, his title Molla suggests that he could be a member of the men of word ulema. Abdullah Molla accused Musa A of forgetting that the A had only possessed this estate on the condition of transferring it to the Sultan or a high ranking member of the ruling elite when needed. Disturbed by this comment, Musa A stated that he still remembered this condition. After offering his profound gratitude to the Sultan, for facilitating the land accusation process and the payment conditions, he wrote that he relinquishes property rights to the vineyard, the mansion located in it, and the other pieces of land that he had gradually possessed. He then listed the estate that he had to hand over their title deeds, 48 dunum of arable lands, 15 dunum of land, and six quarries, making a total of 100 dunum of land, or roughly 250 acres. By comparing himself to an aunt who offered a small present to the Prophet Suleiman, he finished his letter by pleading that the Sultan accepts his small gift. The first issue that this letter raises concerns the land accusation process. Although Musa A keeps repeating his gratitude to the Sultan, his tone suggests that he unwillingly abandoned his property rights. Here, I should remind that the Hamidiyeva had been incrementally reappropriating lands at Istavros Beylar Beye since the mosque's construction. The deed of the Hamidiyeva, issued on the 11th of January 1781, presents the plot that this work gradually observed and shows that the total area exceeded the surface area of the mosque. It includes pieces of land located both on the shoreline and inland. Here you can see the additional pieces of land, and the first one is where the mosque stands, uh, even today. And in addition to this piece of land, uh, the Hamidiye Vakf also incorporated the Bostancıbaşı Abdullah Vakf, which had been administrating the inland located Istavros Vakf village in this locality since 1502. Thereby, the Hamidiye Vakf started to control the lands of this Vakf village, which was mostly populated by non-Muslims. The extent of the land acquired by the Hamidiye Vak predicts an upcoming transformation in the Star Wars Beylar Bey area. The document that I have examined also confirms that even eight years after the completion of the mosque, the Hamidiye Vak continued to acquire more land and gradually establish control over an area radi radiating inland from the shores. Thus, it is reasonable to assume that some of the previous landholders might have been also forced to abandon their property rights in this process. The secondly, the letter alludes to the involvement of the treasurer Etem Efendi and a certain Abdul Haq Molla Efendi. It is indeed surprising to see that these actors, members of the Ottoman bureaucracy, were involved in the decision-making process of the Hamidiye Vak for a piece of land on the shoreline. The period in question actually corresponds to a juncture in the history of Ottoman Bakhs, namely the beginning of their centralization process. In 1775, Abdulhamid I set up a separate and autonomous organization to manage his Bakh, the office of the Hamidiye Bakhs, or Evkafe Hamidiye Kaymakamlı. Although still supervised by the chief black eunuch, this organization contained three independent offices, one overseeing its administration, another recording the VAC's revenues and expenditures, and the third supervising financial transactions. Evkapa Media Kaimakamlı was accepted as the precursor of the Ministry of Sultanic VAC's 
Evkaf-ı Hümayun Nezareti, which would be established in 1826. Musa's letter demonstrate that a wide group of decision makers, including various state actors in different posts and level in the central government, were behind the implementation of the Hamidiya Vak in association with the restructuring of the Vak system. Thereby, this letter provides us with a snapshot of the functioning of the Ottoman bureaucracy in this period and underlines its transforming character. Thirdly, that Musa A was forced first to buy this estate to prevent a foreigner from settling there and then to abandon his property rights strongly suggests that the actors mentioned above were concerned with the question of who would occupy the Istaroz Beylar Bey shoreline. In fact, the three published journals of the Chief of Palace Gardeners between 1781 and 1803 identified the new occupiers of the Istaroz Beylar Bey shores the great majority of whom were Ottoman Muslims. This is the list of residents according to the first journal kept in 18, uh, 1781. And these new residents were the lower ranking officials of the Ottoman bureaucracy, whose influence was increasing in the courtly circles over the course of the 18th century. Their growing influence seems to have materialized in their presence uh, in, the pre in their presence on Istaroz Beylar Beye, as the new residents of the waterfront mentions yellow a line on the waterfront. Here, two imperial edicts dating to the 1760s indicate that some new parameters had been already emerging to control the sociocultural and religious ordering of the Bosphorus shores for the last two decades. On the 10th of August, 1763, Mustafa III sent an order to the chief of palace gardeners, who was in charge of the security along the Bosphorus. The Sultan was concerned with the people using coffee houses and organizing both excursions along the Bosphorus shores. He ordered that those who acted indecently against good moral values and played music would be prohibited from the area, while those who behaved decently and came to the seaside for sightseeing or quiet recreation would be allowed. This edict addresses the central government's attempt to increase social policing on the Bosphorus shores. The second decree, dated the 18th of April, 1764, highlights the residency of non-Muslims on the Bosphorus and as, as another concern for the central government. This document informed the Sultan about the resolution of a conflict over the regulation of construction activity in Galata. Nevertheless, it started with a reminder of his previous imperial orders, which had prohibited non-Muslims from rebuilding their houses devastated by fire or earthquake, and from constructing new buildings on the vacant lands on the middles and coast of Istanbul, including the shores of the Bosphorus. So to conclude, Musa A's letter gave insights into the land policies adopted in the 1780s when a new neighborhood on the Istaroz Beylar Bey shores began to develop. It also demonstrated how the expanded group of state actors decided the future landholders and revealed the increasing socio territorial control and moral surveillance on the Bosphorus shores. Although this case study does not draw a monolithic image of the transforming social landscape of the Bosphorus, it shows the sociopolitical dynamics behind the early phase of urbanization of the Bosphorus shores. It thereby advances our knowledge on the emergence of some socioeconomic, cultural, and ethno-religious parameters gradually identified by the central government to shape the social landscape of Istanbul by the turn of the 19th century. Now I'm going to give the floor to Doha. Thank you very much. Um, the title of my paper is Philanthropy and Self-Identification in Late Ottoman Egypt. In the 19th century Ottoman Empire, philanthropy was one of the most efficient tools the Ottoman ruling elites used to bolster their legitimacy in the eyes of the population. The most common method of performing philanthropic deeds at this time was the collection of iana or donations from different segments of society. These donations were then used for a variety of purposes, ranging from supporting the Ottoman army to providing aid to refugees and building orphanages. 
Moreover, in line with the dominant ideas of the period, performing philanthropical acts came to be seen as a way to express one's patriotic or nationalist feelings. Not surprisingly, the Egyptian ruling elite also made use of philanthropy to legitimize their own positions in Egypt. By the end of the 19th century, Egypt was ruled by the members of the Mehmed Ali Pasha dynasty who held the title of Hidiv and had a special place within the Ottoman administrative structure. Even though Egypt was technically still a province of the Ottoman Empire at this time, ever since the British occupation of Egypt in 1882, the Ottoman political control over the province was mostly nominal. Due to this special place held by Egypt within the Ottoman Empire, most of the literature that analyzes the philanthropic act efforts of the Egyptian ruling elite approaches the topic from an Egypt-centric perspective without taking the wider Ottoman context into consideration. I take a different approach in this paper and focus on the philanthropic deeds which the members of the Egyptian ruling family undertook during the Ottoman Greek War of 1897 and the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913 in their efforts to help the Ottoman Empire. Following the works of scholars such as Halit Fahmi, Ehud Toledano, and Adam Messian, who analyzed the 19th century Egypt within the framework of the Ottoman Empire, and basing my analysis on Arabic language newspapers and documents from the Ottoman archives, I argue that the Egyptian ruling elite, while harboring very close ties with Egypt, also continued to self-identify as Ottomans under various historical contexts until the World War I. I claim that if we take a step back and stop seeing the Egyptian ruling elite as proto-nationalist figures and locate them within the larger imperial framework, a different picture emerges where the Egyptian ruling elites are imbued with a sense of Ottoman patriotism. Lastly, Highlighting the role the female members of the Egyptian ruling family played in donation campaigns, I demonstrate how, especially in times of crises, philanthropic activities enabled women to publicly express their sense of patriotism and contribute to community building efforts. During the Ottoman Greek War of 1897 and the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913, donation collection campaigns were organized all over Egypt in order to support the Ottoman army and, especially in the case of the Balkan Wars, the Ottoman refugees. Even though different segments of the Egyptian society took part in these campaigns, the Egyptian ruling elite played a major leading role in organizing of and contributing to these efforts, demonstrating their solidarity with the Ottoman Empire. In March 1897, for instance, the Egyptian newspaper Al Muayyad reported the establishment of donation collection committees for the Ottoman army in Alexandria and Cairo, emphasizing the fact that this movement had the blessing of the Khedive Abbasimi Pasha. The newspaper interpreted these donation collection efforts as a proof of the idea that national spirit and patriotic zeal had gained ascendancy in Egypt, as people from all over the province were contributing to the collection of aid for, quote unquote, their state and their community. Moreover, Egyptian newspapers reported that in addition to Hidiv Abbasi Ab Hilmi Pasha, other members of the Egyptian ruling family, such as Prince Hussein Chamil Pasha and Ibrahim Hilmi Pasha, made significant donations to help the Ottoman army during this, its war with Greece in 1897. The main rationale behind this upsurge of Ottoman patriotism was the belief that an Ottoman victory against Greece would be a proof of the strength of the Ottoman Empire, which would then be able to better protect the rights of Egypt vis-a-vis -vis the British who were occupying the province since 1882. Similar to the Ottoman Greek War of 1897, the Egyptian ruling elite played a major role in organizing aid collection efforts during the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913. Omar Tosun Pasha, who was the grandson of uh, Said Pasha, governor of Egypt between 1854 
and 1863, for instance, was the head of the donation collection committee that was established in Egypt at the start of the war. In a speech he had made in October 1912, Omar Tosun Pasha emphasized the importance of helping the empire in these critical times. More significantly, Omar Tosun Pasha underlined the unity of the Egyptians in their work to help their state, meaning the Ottoman Empire. His leadership in these efforts indicates a continued presence of a cultural and emotional attachment to the empire among the highest echelons of Egyptian ruling elite, as well as demonstrating the prevalence of Ottoman patriotism that continued to hold sway for the members of the Egyptian ruling family. In addition to Emir Tosun Pasha, Prince Mehmed Ali Pasha, son of Hidev Abbas Ilmi, was a leading member of the Aid Collection Committee, while the donor lists published in the Egyptian newspapers show that other members of the Egyptian ruling family made significant contributions to the aid collection efforts. Female members of the Egyptian ruling household also played key roles in the philanthropy activities of 1897 and 1912-1913. Through their contributions, they publicly demonstrated their sense of Ottoman patriotism and their solidarity with the Ottoman Empire. Egyptian newspapers reported that during the Ottoman Greek War, a separate aid collection committee for women was established. Lists published in these newspapers demonstrate that several members of the Egyptian ruling dynasty, female members of the Egyptian ruling dynasty, joined the campaign to help the Ottoman Empire by making contributions. On a list published in Al Muayyad on 22nd of March, 1897, for instance, the name of Cheshmi Afet Hanım, who was the wife of former Khidiv Ismail Pasha, can be seen among the donors. Other lists that were published in Al-Ahram feature Ismail Pasha's wives, Janan Yaranam, Efendi, and Gülen Damalım, who were living in Egypt at the time. It is also important to note that these women of the Egyptian ruling household played exemplary roles, leading roles, in leading the female relatives of the Egyptian bureaucratic elite to join the donation collection campaigns that were being organized throughout Egypt at this time. The philanthropic efforts undertaken by the female members of the Egyptian ruling household during the Balkan Wars provide another opportunity to observe the continuing prevalence of Ottoman patriotism for the Egyptian ruling elite. On October 30, 1912, Al-Ahram published the names of Egyptian royal family members who had donated to the Ottoman Red Crescent, which was playing a very active role on the battlefield at this time. The list featured several princes and numerous female members of the family, notably Khedive's mother, Princess Emine Ilhami, who had don donated 2,000 guineas, Princess Zeynep Hilmi, wife of Prince Mahmoud Hilmi Pasha, and Princess Rukiyanum family. Moreover, some women of the Khedive family actually went beyond simply donating money and undertook other acts of philanthropy as well. On November 16, 1912, for instance, Al-Ahram informed its readers on a front page article that Princess Emine Ilhami intended to build a hospital in Istanbul for wounded Ottoman soldiers. According to the article, the hospital was to be built on the grounds of her palace in Bebek, a neighborhood in, on the Bosphorus in Istanbul. She was, Emine Ilhami, was also to provide for doctors, pharmacists, and necessary medical equipment. Another article published on November 27 additionally reported that she had ordered the collection of winter clothing to be sent to Istanbul and distributed among the Muslim refugees who had fled the war in the Balkans. Lastly, it must be noted that Istanbul was very much aware of and appreciated these efforts that the Egyptian ruling elite was undertaking to help the empire in these difficult times. During the Ottoman Greek War of 1897, Ahmed Mutar Pasha, who was the Ottoman High Commissioner in Egypt at the time, informed Sultan Abdul Hamid of the donation collection drive that was going on in Egypt and of the personal donations made by the Hidiv and his mother, suggesting that members of the Egyptian ruling elite who made significant contributions to the campaign should be rewarded with decorations and medals. 
Sultan Abdul Hamid looked on this upsurge of Ottoman consciousness in Egypt very positively, as can be seen clearly in a telegraph that he sent to Ahmed, Ahmed Mutar Pasha, in which he expressed his gratitude to the members of the donation, donation collection committee and the Egyptian population in general. Similarly, in November 1912, Sultan Mehmet Reshad specifically thanked Hidi's mother, as well as Prince Mehmed Ali and Ahmed Tursun Pashas, for their efforts in, their, in collecting aid for the Ottoman military on the Ottoman Red Crescent during the Balkan Wars. These greetings to the ruling elite were widely publicized in the press for the Egyptian public. Moreover, Sultan Mehmet Rashad granted decorations to various female members of the Egyptian ruling family, such as Princess Nevjiran Hanum and Princess Fatima Hanum, to show his appreciation for their efforts to help the empire during the Balkan Wars. To conclude, I would argue that examining the philanthropic acts that the Egyptian ruling elite undertook in the Ottoman Greek War of 1897 and the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913 reveals the ex existence of a multi-tiered form of self-identification and patriotism in late Ottoman Egypt. Even though there's no doubt that by the end of the 19th and early 20th century, members of the Egyptian ruling family had deep roots in Egypt, the fact that they voluntarily organized and contributed to wide-scale wide donation collection campaigns to help the Ottoman Empire in its difficult times demonstrates the continuing prevalence of a sense of Ottoman patriotism and Ottoman consciousness in Egypt until World War I. On a wider scale, my paper points to the fragmented and fluid nature of self-identification in late Ottoman Egypt, while it also demonstrates that Egyptian ruling elites continue to be an integral part of the wider Ottoman world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much uh, to all our presenters. Uh, we had like three really insightful papers today. So now it's time for a discussion, but just a quick reminder uh, for our audience, please feel free to post your questions on the Q&A function because after discussion, we will have time uh, for for your um, questions. Um, so uh, thank you very much. As I said, uh, so I will uh, I will just um, uh, put together uh, some questions just to start off the discussion. So uh, I will go by an order of presentation. So I will start with Mohammed. Um, so, uh, Mohammed, your paper delves into quite an understudied area of Ottoman Iranian encounters and focuses on this 25-year-old, uh, year-long Sunni Afghan rule after the collapse of the Safavid Empire. There seems to be two important issues here. First, of course, are the, the issue of territorial sovereignty. The basis of the relationship between the two empires was shaped by the you know, Treaty of Castro Shirin back in 1639, which established the boundaries in between these powers and survived into our day with little change. And of course, we assume a very rigid distinction between these empires, Sunni and Shiite realms of power. Secondly, uh, there is this question of the caliphate. Uh, we often assume that the Ottoman caliphate was instrumental in the 16th and 19th centuries, especially through the 19th century when Pan-Islamism became a highly influential political tool to resist against European imperialism and ideals of civilizational universalism. So you showed us how the Ottoman Empire used the caliphate as an instrumental tool of soft power during this period in question. So maybe we can elaborate a little more on this Ottoman use of, you know, soft power, a term you use um, to elaborate their claims to territorial sovereignty against a newly emerging Sunni Afghan rule. We know that soft power is very much a, you know, a post-Cold War uh, term coined in 1980s by scholars of international politics. And it's all about, you know, attracting and co-opting others rather than, you know, using uh, military force. So it was really insightful and interesting to rethink Ottoman support uh, for the Safavid Shiite princes as use of soft power. And you also showed uh, that, you know, the situation soon evolved into 
a military conflict uh, between Afghans and, and Ottomans in 1726. So my first question is about your choice of uh, terminology, how the use of soft power adds onto our thinking about these, you know, this particular conflict between the two powers. And also, uh, can we uh, use this term um, as a tool to better understand the ideal of a universal Ottoman Caliphate during the 19th century? So uh, how can we use this uh, term and what can we make of it? Uh, this is my first question. Uh, secondly, uh, could you please tell us a little more about uh, the uh, Sunni-Shiite divide during this period? Because uh, we know that, for example, in 1880s and 90s, Abdul Hamid also propagated the idea of uh, a Sunni-Shiite unity as a long-term pragmatic solution. We know that Javed Pasha, for example, wrote a report on this and, you know, discussed that such a unity could be put into practice under the leadership of the Ottoman Caliphate, as well as the support of the Shiite ulema. So have you encountered similar instances in your own research that would enrich our understanding of the uh, Sunni-Shiite divide, or shall we say at times, at certain times, unity uh, especially in relation to the caliphate and the ulema in, in both empires. Uh, Nazla, you presented a very interesting case study on the transformation of the Beylerbi neighborhood uh, following the construction of uh, the Hamidi Evvel Mosque and changing policies of land distribution on the Beylerbi and Istorbos royal gardens. The case of Musa'a in particular provides us some clues about the overall process of land transactions in the area and how the neighborhood was restructured uh, through the Hamidiya Vakf during the period in question. So um, I would like to ask you about how your research on Beylerbi speaks to the existing literature uh, on Ottoman settlement policies in Istanbul during the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, we can think about the transformation of the Galata neighborhood, for example, uh, Etem Adam's work or Paolo Girardelli's work uh, following the construction of the Galata Mosque on the ruins of the San Francisco convent shows how the imperial center sh reshaped its you know, religious and demographic composition by relocating uh, non-Muslim Ottoman subjects in the area. And then Shirin Hamede also shows how this policy of Islamization, which started in the lower section of the Gal um, Golden Horn, was gradually extended into the shores of the Bosporus through the 18th century. Uh, so we see a similar trend uh, following the construction of the Ortaköy Mosque when non-Muslim Ottomans were forced to relocate. So in the light of this literature, how would you situate the process of land distribution at Beylar Beye? Do you see any peculiarities or shall we see it as part of this general trend towards the uh, gradual Islamization of the Bosporus shores or, you know, how about land distribution of, of, uh, of uh, existing royal gardens through a newly established Vox institution? So there seems to be uh, two different uh, and, of course, interrelated uh, issues here. Uh, Secondly, you mentioned about different groups and their competing interest over the lands in question. So could you tell us a little more about who these individuals were and the role of the Hamidiya Waqf in redistributing the lands in the area? And lastly, I would like to ask you to expand a little bit on the case of Musa A and his claims of land ownership, because I know that the document you presented was a draft letter, but it very nicely shows how he resisted against the confiscation of this property uh, by the Hamidia Box. So uh, what were the institute, what was the institutional framework looked like and who were the agents and the, you know, uh, interests at, at stake here in relation to this uh, newly under, new understanding of uh, private property. Um, Doa, um, you, you presented a very interesting paper uh, focusing on the philanthropic activities of the Egyptian ruling elite 
during the Ottoman Greek War and the Balkan Wars and argued that these philanthropic activities signified a multitude form of self-identification and patriotism in Egypt. In fact, uh, philanthropy as a field of study has many dimensions. It's very rich. It's not a simple act of gift giving or charity from one side to the other. There are various sides of this relationship, such as class, gender, and their national identitism, religion, poor relief, welfare, um, civil society, political control. So just to name a few. And it leaves behind its material record. As you mentioned, there are buildings, schools, orphanages, newspapers, financial records, and legal documents. So it's a very, very rich area of study. So from the Imperial Center, we know that there existed an ongoing tradition of charity in the empire. So Amy Singer's work, she shows off how Islamic charity bears interesting comparisons to Judeo-Christian traditions. And then we also know that a shift occurs somewhere sometime in the 19th century when Abdul Hamid used philanthropy as a political tool to unify it you know, rather fragmented society, fundraising campaigns uh, for, you know, patriotic purposes. So, uh, so one important thing to note maybe here, just philanthropy during the time of Abdul Hamid was also about loyalty to the Ottoman Sultan, but not necessarily state patriotism. So here I'm just referring to Hassan Kayala's work. So uh, philanthropy as state patriotism occurs only after 1908. So my question is like, how would you situate uh, philanthropic activities in Egypt um, in the light of this, you know, overarching framework, especially if you look at Egypt uh, from the imperial center? Does it play a formative role in shaping patriotic feelings, loyalty to the Ottoman Sultan? Does it have any effect in organizing the masses or was it more of like an elite endeavor? And uh, this also brings me uh, to my second question, as you mentioned about the Greek war and the Balkan wars. So do you see any differences uh, between philanthropic activities between these uh, two wars uh, in terms of Egyptians' allegiance to the Ottoman ruler, empire, or a bigger ideal of state patriotism? And, um, Secondly, you also mentioned about uh, female philanthropists, female philanthropy as a broader 19th century phenomenon. Women were seen as agents of social change, improvement, and were encouraged for charitable activities. So you mentioned about Princess Imne Ilhami, Zeynep Hilmi, and Rukia Hanum. So could you tell us more about who these women were? How were they connected to Istanbul? And what were their networks and interests behind these uh, philanthropic activities. Could we argue that philanthropic activities would strengthen their ties to the Imperial Center and ensure them recognition in Istanbul? Or, you know, quite provocatively maybe, could we just suggest that, you know, philanthropy was also a way for the Egyptian ruling elite to attach themselves to this uh, very European uh, culture of philanthropy? in their own way uh, through the 19th and early 20th centuries. Thank you. I think we should start with Mohammed, then go to Nazla, and then finally to Dora. Thank you for these questions. And let me go over them one by one. Yeah, the first question is um, how the use of soft power adds to our understanding of uh, both the universal Ottoman Caliphate and also the Sunni relations at the time. Let me uh, show you um, the map of the Ottomans in, in most of the early modern era. So do you see the uh, shared screen? Okay, thank you. So actually it is important to look at that map because um, as I told in my uh, presentation, it was highly difficult for a pre-modern uh, imperial center to control all these vast lands. Mostly in the scholarship, we focus on the hard power that is required 
to take control of all these lands. However, it is not sufficient, as we see from today's world, not sufficient to, uh, to maintain the, the control over that kind of big lands that included, included so many uh, different populations from different sects and identities, etc. So, uh, in this sense, the use of soft power is quite critical. And actually, uh, we talk about uh, soft power, even though we don't call it a soft power in history. When we talk about religion, we mostly uh, conceptualize religion uh, as the instrument that um, that made it uh, available uh, for the rulers uh, to 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 convince the, the subjects and to legit, to legitimize their rules. But to me, it seems that we just skip it uh, too uh, too fast. However, if something gives legitimacy to a regime then it is something quite important. How, how that thing gives legitimacy to a certain regime? How does it work? How is it functioning? So that's why in my thesis, I try to dig out that perspective, that, 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 that area. So how does it, legit, how does it uh, enables the rulers uh, to, to convince others uh, for their uh for, for for the projects or for for the uh legitimacy of their own dynasty so in in this sense the ottoman universal caliphate worked uh as as an important uh factor and uh support that enabled and uh, that enabled the ottoman sultan dynasties unchallenged authority in these vast domains. For the first question, uh, this is my answer, but I can keep going, but uh, I don't think that it is uh, that appropriate at that time. And uh, due to the multiple of questions and the, uh, the time. Uh, so let me go to the second question. What about the Sunni Shia she divide in this period or the uh, unity efforts uh, in the 1720s. Uh, there, there are two trends in, in, in the early modern era, uh, as far as I, I, I can see. One is confessionalism. So the empires or states engaged in confession, in efforts of confessionalization. This is also, of course, a process of top down and bottom up. However, uh, the confessionalism, uh, the, 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 ident the confessional identity was established mostly uh, in, this, uh, in the 18th century. However, uh, this is just one, one, one part. The second part is with the, the relation between Sunnis and Shis, they are still Muslims. They go to pilgrimage and they met in Mecca and Medina all together, all in the in the ways. They turn into they turn towards the same uh, direction during prayers, and also specifically regarding the Ottoman uh, and uh, Persian relations. Since, as you said, uh, six, uh, 1639, there is an ongoing peace between Ottomans and Persians. So it was not easy. Uh, to, to uh, solve this question, but um, for example, in 1723, when Ottoman Sheikh Islam uh, issued a fatwa to declare war on the Safavids based on their uh, infidelity due to their heresy, uh, a, a, an earlier Qadr judge uh, just opposed to this wave and he said that no they cannot be uh, they cannot be excommunicated they cannot be declared as infidel because uh, they are turning towards they were turning towards Kaaba so they are they're, they're basically they're pray they are they are Muslims so you cannot uh, declare war on them 
and that that person uh, as you can uh, imagine just uh, was sent into exile into lemnos uh, <laughs> at that time uh, or in in the for example patrona rebellion of uh, 1730 the re rebel groups used both of the arguments uh, against ahmed the third or against the government on the one line they said that uh, we we fought against the uh, against the Safavids, and we just uh, it was an unlawful war because they were not uh, targeting us. They were not attacking us. So we just broke the uh, peace between the Muslims, and then uh, got punished us in 1730 with Nadir, the the new uh, Persian guy. On the other hand. They say that uh, you supported Safavids, Shi Safavids, against our co-religionist Muslim Afghans. That's why it got punished us. So things are really complicated, and the confessional identity was used uh, in different senses by different actors. Uh, for for to, to attain their goals in general, uh, and in in 1736, Nadir Shah uh, came with the uh, new offer of Jaffarism, uh, which alleged that uh, Shiism turns turned into Jaffarism, uh, etc. And then uh, it's it's also another complicated matter, but Nadir's uh, attempt can also be considered as a unity attempt between the Sunnis and Shis at that period. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess now it's my turn. Um, thank you very much for the questions. Um, I'd like to start with the first one, where you asked the peculiarity of the Istavros Beylar Bey case study area, which makes it um, different from, uh, let's say, Galata Mosque's example. Um, I think the particularity of this case study stems from the location of um, its location. Um, so basically, Istavros Beylar Bey was on the Asian shores of the Bosphorus, and until mid 18th century or even early years of the 19th century, the Asian shores of the Bosphorus were mainly rural and it housed um, villages and royal gardens. So, um, and these royal gardens housed summer palaces uh, occupied by the Ottoman dynasty, as well as the um, palace like. Uh, waterfront mentions of the high ranking member of the ruling elite. So what um, this story in the um, Istaros case study points out is that how um, the lands that had been that had been used by the Ottoman royal dynasty and the high ranking members of the ruling elite passed to the hands of the lower ranking members of the ruling elite. And uh, this um, is actually a transformation of the royal garden. So this gives us clues about this. But at the same time, I'd like to um, add more a bit on that. Um, first, um, starting from 1760s, a new form of socio-territorial control seemingly uh, appears on the Bosphorus shores. And for this um, uh, process, I think the Vox uh, is being again utilized as a settlement policy to actually increase the control of the process of, let's say, urbanization uh, of the Bosphorus shores. And, and I think that's an um, important concern for the state, given that this period, the last quarter of the 18th century, also corresponds to the end of uh, Crimean War, the Russian War, that uh, resulted. Um, with Russia has the chance to use the Bosphorus whenever they want to use, as well as uh, their increasing claims uh, for the Orthodox in um, Istanbul. So in this framework, um, the fortification of Bosphorus, the security of Bosphorus is a raising concern. And I would say along this process, also establishing a controlled growth on the Bosphorus shores, uh, using the Royal Gardens uh, seems like the um, defining the context which makes the case study different uh, from the ones you mentioned. I think the transformation of Ayazma Garden into Ayazma Mosque, uh, parts of Üsküdar Royal Garden into Ihsaniye, similar trend in uh, uh, Pasha Bahçe, 
and as well as the Emirgan Royal Garden on the northern section of the European shores. I think that explains the um, kind of the, 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 the twist of this case study. Um, secondly, uh, you ask about the actors. Um, so since my focus was on the transformation of the royal gardens, how they had been utilized and how the land was distributed, my um, focus was the people who were eligible to receive lands from royal gardens, which means uh, different segments of the ruling elite. So my focus was mainly um, between um, actually how um, high ranking ruling elites lost some of uh, their um, popularity to receive lands and lower ranking ruling elites, the members of the newly rising and growing Ottoman bureaucracy um, started to um, gain uh, grounds. And, um, and Hamidia Vakf uh, was, um, was controlling all the property exchanges. I mean, uh, the other documents that I come across uh, shows that they, um, they supervise all the property transactions and also, there are some um, requests that is uh, even being sent to the Sultan. Uh, for instance, a husband and wife wants to settle in a waterfront mansion, but it's being denied. So um, the state was uh, the central government, let's say, and the Truha Media Vak was uh, actually supervising the new residents. And for your third question, um, the process about private ownership. Um, as you are saying, Musa As um, case actually shows that how he somehow tried to resist to keep uh, the land he possessed under his own use. Um, at the same time, other documents that I examine in my dissertation um, somehow shows that the existing landholders try to navigate the system and keep um, the land they possess as much as possible. So on that side of the story, it shows um, rising demands for private uh, ownership. At the same time, uh, when we look at the changing uh, leasing system in the VAC, um, the longer periods for leasing, the Jaritain contact, and the increasing uh, increased rights of the tenants to use the land um, also kind of uh, um, address this point. Also, and I, um, I do think that the state's reappropriation of uh, the lands on the shores and this new form of socio-territorial control, all of them uh, together, um, suggests the formalization, uh, the process of formalization of the private property, which is going to be consolidated after the Tanzimat reform. But I think the period um, after 1760s um, addressed this uh, transition, let's say. Um, for the time being, so those will be my answers. And thank you. Thank you very much, Nasla. Uh, so I will start with your second question. Uh, is there a distinction between the Ottoman Greek War and the Balkan Wars? Um, so the short answer is yes. Um, so the, the Ottoman Greek War of 1897 and the Balkan Wars, uh, so I picked those for a specific reason uh, in my dissertation uh, and dedicated a chapter each and looked at how they were received uh, in Egypt uh, by the ruling and intellectual elite uh, of the time. And the reason I picked those was the F Ottoman Greek War of 1897 was actually uh, a very rare occasion in the sense that it was, a, it was a military victory, even though diplomatically later on, um, it, was a, it was like a disaster, but um, militarily it was, a, it was a victory. And it kind of, made the intellectual and ruling elite in Egypt um, hope uh, that the Ottoman Empire would kind of regain its strength and then be able to face the European powers more effectively. And in Egypt's case, the most uh, urgent matter is uh, getting British out of uh, the, uh, out of Egypt, out of the province. Um, so in that sense, it, the, the war led uh, and the victory led to this outpour of um, Ottoman consciousness, Ottoman patriotism and among the intellectuals and the ruling elite. And that's why they uh, were very much in support 
of the empire. And then that's why they were organizing these donation collection campaigns to help the Ottoman Empire and to help the Ottoman military. Um, like conversely, though, the Balkan Wars was the was one of the most important or like um, disastrous uh, defeats that the Ottoman Empire faced in its long history. They lost all the uh, all their provinces, almost all their provinces in Europe, and the very future or the very existence of um, the Ottoman Empire was at stake at that point. Um, so they, so here you you can see a slight shift uh, among the Egyptian intelligentsia or Egyptian ruling elite, uh, even though they are still supportive and then they still demonstrate their Ottoman patriotism, you see more of a shift towards uh, the idea that, okay, like uh, the empire may be collapsing now, so we have to take care of ourselves. We cannot count on um, the, the, the Ottoman empire to protect us against the British. Um, that, I mean, some may argue that this feeling um, was much, like came into being much more, much earlier. And there's some truth to that, but this moment, this, moment, this defeat in the Balkan Wars was this um, very uh, distinct uh, breaking point for the Egyptian uh, ruling elite. Um, so that kind of ties your first question where it's, uh, where you ask, um, was this a loyalty to the Sultan or was it like a state patriotism? Um, so in, in the Ottoman Greek war, you see, um, you see references a lot, a lot of references to the Caliphate, to the Sultan, to the allegiance to the Sultan, allegiance to the Caliphate. So in that sense, you can, you can argue it was more of a like loyalty to the, um, to the, to the, to the office of Caliph, Caliph. Um, but underlying that, as I said, since they were hoping that a stronger Ottoman Empire would be able, able to protect them against the British, you also kind of see a uh, allusion to the Ottoman state, like a, a strong Ottoman state equals a stronger Egypt, uh, equals British out of um, British being out of uh, Egypt. So in that sense, even though their language or the, the discursive um, narrative is uh, based on loyalty to the Ottoman Sultan, to the Ottoman Caliph. Um, the underlying reason I think is much more of a like Ottoman patriotism based on uh, a stronger state. Uh, but in the, in the Balkan Wars, you see much more of a, again, a state uh, patriotism uh, because at, at that point, the young Turks are in power and the Sultan is more, much more like a figurehead. Uh, you, still see, you still see the references to the Caliph uh, and the Sultan, but um, I think there the identity or, or the, 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 the allegiance is much more strongly emphasized to be to the Ottoman, Ottoman state, even though, as I said, they were at this point considering of breaking off uh, because uh, Ottoman Empire, they thought, was about to collapse. Um, thirdly, if we look at the women um, roles that they, they played, so unfortunately, I could, I like, the, my sources were much, much more mostly newspapers, and then you don't see the uh, quote unquote voices of these females, direct voices of these females in, in, in uh, through the newspapers. Um, but I get the sense that they were very much um, like they, they, they were very much actively taking part in this process as a way to demonstrate their own sense of um, like Ottoman consciousness or Ottoman patriotism. Uh, they were, they wanted their names to be included in those lists that were being published almost daily in the Egyptian press, because uh, that was a way for them to um, actually perform their sense of Ottoman patriotism in a public sphere. Uh, public sphere. Um, and they had a lot of ties to Egypt, uh, to uh, ties to, the, to, to Istanbul. Uh, for example, in another chapter, I looked at um, how Ottoman medals um, played a role um, in connecting Egypt and, is and Istanbul. And then there you see women, uh, especially during the times of time of Abdul Hamid, uh, Egyptian, uh, Egypt, uh, women from the Egyptian ruling family writing to Sultan Abdul Hamid and almost like asking or begging them, begging him to grant them a, uh, uh, an order, a nishan. Uh, 
So in that sense, you see this connection between Cairo and Istanbul or Egypt and uh, Istanbul. Um, so they were taking part in this philanthropic campaign or can, uh, to assert their uh, place within the Ottoman world, I would argue. Um, and as you said, they had very deep connection to Istanbul. They were vacationing in Istanbul. They had houses in Istanbul, palaces in Istanbul. Um, so yeah, uh, I think I'll stop here. So we can talk about it later uh, in more detail if uh, there are any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so maybe then we should uh, move on to the Q&A session. Uh, so I will uh, go through the questions uh, one by one. I would like to start uh, by with a question by uh, Professor Baki Tezjan. Um, he has a question for uh, Muhammad. So he's asking, are there other examples of Ottomans asserting their claim uh, to the universal caliphate between the 16th and 19th um, centuries? Yes. Uh... After the acquisition of uh, Memlik lands and Mecca and Medina, uh, Selim II first uh, declared himself as the Caliph of Prophet and also uh, as the Great Caliph, Halifi Kubra and Halifi Rasul. These are the distinguishing uh, qualities uh, of being the Caliph, the universal Caliph in the Muslim world. Uh, and following him, all the Ottoman sultans uh, continued to uh, call themselves as the great caliph. Um, and especially with, uh, in relations with Moroccan and uh, uh, Mughal, uh, Mughal rulers, there had been a continuous competition uh, between the Ottoman sultan and the Mughal ruler and also the Moroccan ruler on the caliphate, who is the caliph? Uh, so that th that is actually a very interesting point, but mainly uh, just uh, looked over in the scholarship, and there are mainly two uh, two doctoral dissertations uh, written in the late eighties and uh, early nineties. One is on Moroccan, and the other is on uh, Mughal relations. And recently, uh, Selim Güngörüler also uh, uh, published an article on the uh, Ottoman uh, insistence on the universal caliphate of the Sultan uh, over the uh, Safavid Shahs. And he showed that uh, Safavid Shahs also accepted Ottoman Sultans as universal caliphs uh, in the Muslim world. So actually, yes, the, the answer is yes. And there are many examples. Just uh, in one sentence, we can say that actually the relation between the major Sunni powers at that time, the Ottomans, uh, the Moroccans, and uh, the Mughals were characterized by mainly competition over this uh, highly coveted title rather than uh, Sunni solidarity, because that is the point uh, that that made you different from others. If you are uh, speaking the same language, then you can uh, become a challenging alternative against the, the other uh, ruler. So that's why they try to justify their position uh, on these religio-political grounds very much throughout centuries. And the, the only difference in the 1720s from the perspective of the port, the uh, Constantinople, I, as I argue, was that it just uh, happened at the gate of the Ottoman borders. That's why we can see the, uh, the clash in a more clear way. Actually, the clash or competition had always been there throughout the early modern era. But because of the distance between Constantinople and Morocco and, uh, and uh, India, the competition did not turn into a real war or fight. 
However, they even come very close to fight as well. But they just did not fight mainly due to this distance. Uh, in, for example, in, uh, in the late, late, 16th century, uh, late 17th century, the Moroccans fought against the Algerians who were under the Ottomans. Uh, and it was uh, during the time of the Great Turkish War when the Ottomans were fighting against the, uh, against the Holy League. And the Moroccan attack on the Algerians uh, was a very uh, undermining thing for the Ottomans. And the Ottoman Sultan threatened the Moroccan ruler that I am the Caliph, and if you continue attacking on Algerians, then next year, Moroccan pilgrims were, are not going to be allowed in Mecca and Medina. So the competition came to that level in certain times. Thank you very much. Um, so we have another uh, question uh, from Professor uh, Tezjan for uh, Doha. Uh, so what happens during the World War that follows the Balkan Wars? How do the members of the Egyptian elite their position in between the British and the Ottomans. Thank you for the question, Mark Hojam. Um, so as you as as we know, when the World War One starts, uh, British uh, cuts off the remaining ties of uh, Egypt from the Ottoman Empire and declares it a uh, British protectorate. And at, by this point, Egyptian nationalism is very much um, on the rise, especially after the war in 1919. But um, the Egyptian ruling elite kind of tries to bury or forget, as El, uh, El Toledano uh, uh, says in one of his uh, one of his articles, um, to forget or erase uh, their "quote unquote" Ottoman past and build themselves a new identity as Egyptians, like solely like Egyptians and Egyptian nationalists, and they try to portray themselves as um, founders of modern Egypt which has been a theory or like a thesis that had a great currency until very recently and uh, until 1990s. So, uh, um, Ayo Toledano actually talks about this process in one of his articles called Forgetting Egypt's Ottoman Past through um, the figure of um, Muhammad Farid, uh, who was uh, like, who is known as an, um, like mostly an Egyptian nationalist, but who had a very Ottoman background. Uh, but once the uh, name of the game became nationalism and Egyptian nationalism after the war, especially, uh, most of the Egyptian ruling and intellectual elite tried to distance, like put a distance between themselves and e between Egypt and the Ottoman past. Um, so in that sense, um, the Ottoman past or like the Ottoman sense, Ottoman patriotism uh, is being deliberately um, ignored uh, in order to construct a new identity uh, for themselves as Egyptians. Uh, you see this um, especially in the Arkhalba process where um, the Egyptian elites, uh, the Egyptian, uh, I forgot his name, sorry, but um, uh, after the war, like uh, when they're constructing the archives, they um, deliberately focus much more. Uh, like they, they when they when they open up the archives uh, to these European scholars and they commission them to write um, histories of Egypt, especially like modern histories of Egypt, they deliberately um, translate. Ottoman documents into Arabic, and then they open those documents up to these scholars so that, that they can have, they, get, they only have access to the Arabic versions and not the Ottoman ones. 
and in this sense uh, try to kind of silence uh, the, it's, the Egypt's Ottoman past. Um, so yeah, so after the after the war, um, the Egyptian nationalism becomes much more dominant uh, in the political sphere um, for the elites. Thank you, Doha. And we have another question for you uh, from Orchum Janokan. Um, what can be useful uh, ways to think about the similarities and differences between how the late Ottoman state was perceived by the Egyptian ruling elite and by Syrians of higher socioeconomic, cultural, and political status at around the same time? Um, so thank you. Thank you again for the question. Um, are we talking about the Syrians in Egypt or are we talking about Syrians like in Syria uh, in general? Because I, 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 I'm not very, I don't know that much about like Syria in later on the Ottoman Empire, but the Syrians in Egypt, especially from Lebanon and like greater Syria, um, mm -hmm. they had uh, a, a very important place in the intellectual arena, especially um, uh, of Egypt uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And, um, I mean, it's hard to categorize them or generalize like an opinion for every single one of them, uh, obviously. But um, the ones I looked, for example, the owners of Al-Aram were uh, uh, like were immigrants to uh, Egypt from greater Syria. And if you look at it, they were mostly um, supportive of the Ottoman state, of the Ottoman Empire uh, in Egypt. But... Um, I mean, they also were supporting the Egyptian nationalism, but uh, overall, uh, you can see uh, over the years that they were supporting uh, the Ottoman state or um, uh, through their through the, through their newspapers. Um, for example, uh, again, like Abdul Hamid, uh, like he used to do, uh, granted upon the owners of Al Aram a lot of uh, a bunch of not I would a lot would be saying a lot, uh, a bunch of um, decorations, orders and medals uh, to keep them loyal to himself and to the larger Ottoman state. So, yeah. Um, thank you very much, uh, Doa. And, um, uh, okay, I think, uh, we okay let me see um okay um so um so uh do I have one more question for you uh from amy fallas um so i was wondering how egypt's elite was able to embark on these philanthropic ventures and his support in, in support of the ottomans when the british had such a tight control over their economic affairs especially into the early 20th century and world war one um I would say they had their personal funds, right? Like um, through Egypt, I'm uh, sorry, British were controlling uh, the uh, economy, but they had vast uh, in ruling elite. They owned vast lands and they had other sources of income um, probably. So, um, so they tapped into those sources and um, contributed to these donation collection efforts. Um, I mean, it's obviously they are not, for example, um, like building uh, a new army for the Ottoman Empire and then like, you know, uh, decorating, uh, I mean, um, equipping them with all kinds of war materials and then sending them off. Um, so these donations, these, um, the money donations that they were making were probably not big of a deal for them. I mean, they are a lot of money, especially for considering uh, the fellahin or uh, the middle classes uh, at that time, but uh, they could tap into their, as I said, their personal quote unquote, um, like belong not belongings, but personal sources of income. Uh, I'm thinking of, for example, I'm thinking of uh, land here, like land, uh, uh, like revenues from the land that they owned all, all over Egypt, I would say. I don't know if that answers your questions, uh, but yeah. 
Thank you very much. Um, I think this is uh, the end of uh, our questions. Uh, we had uh, great questions and uh, really um, great answers as always, because uh, your answers also show us like how much uh, more uh, knowledge is there behind uh, this like 15 minute uh, presentation in, uh, in your work. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much uh, for this uh, for this really um, uh, exciting and insightful um, session on uh, on Ottoman uh, soft power and uses of uh, others uh, others. So I would like to uh, thank to our audience and maybe leave the uh, word to uh, Professor Chilik. Uh, in case you would like to have uh, closing remarks or um, anything to add. I will join you, Marve, in thanking our participants and thanking you uh, for your very um, intelligent, very inquisitive and focused papers and for your very articulate answers. There is so much knowledge behind it all that we can see it, we can feel it, but of course uh, it was not possible to have access to all of it during uh, these short presentations. Hopefully other people will be interested in your work and, um, and, and follow you. And of course, we will publish your pieces in the Journal of the uh, Turkish and Ottoman uh, Studies, and that will be another way of acknowledging the importance of um, your work. I think we may have lost some audience to the soccer match, uh, which is going on right now. So uh, for the time being, goodbye, and we will see you in the pages of the journal. Thank you.